Hello, everyone. Welcome to A Doctor's View. I'm Dr. Bolivios. Welcome to the new format of the show, which is uh, we're experimenting with some video podcasting this time. And I hope if you're watching it for the first time, let me know how it goes. If not, we'll stick to the old format. But there we go. So today I'm going to talk about acne. And we have spoken about this on the show before, uh, about two years ago. And to this day, this is one of my, if not the most popular episode I have uh, published. And out of all the 50 or so episodes that are out there, this has probably had about as many views as maybe six or seven of the other top episodes combined. And this led me to realize that this is a big, big topic that people really want to know a lot about. And so the first thing that I have to say is if you're listening or watching this episode as a means of trying to gain some more insight into acne and about something that you're suffering with, please know that you are absolutely not alone. This is a big, big topic. Approximately 95% of all people aged between 11 and 30, are affected by acne. And it is more common in girls and typically aged between 14 and 17. And in boys, they do get it slightly later on, between 16 and 19. But still, the majority is that the majority of the demographic is affected. And everyone tends to have acne on and off in their life. As we, do, as we get older, symptoms do improve. But it is something that many, many, many people suffer with. So... Why am I talking about this again? Well, like I say, it was a a big topic and I just want to give some more updated thoughts regarding um, what we spoke about last time. And last time I I spent quite a lot of time in the episode talking about the different acne treatments uh, that, that were available. And by all means, please do go listen to that first episode. The link will be in the podcast description. But I've realized that people coming onto this, clicking onto this show and clicking onto this episode, they've exhausted their research with regards to acne. They know everything about what it is, what causes it. And and unfortunately, and I'm talking from my own experience, we tend to keep clicking on things until we find a link or find a piece of evidence or find something that goes along with uh, what we want to hear. And unfortunately, that's not always the reality. And so I want to try and talk a bit about that today. So first things first, the I'm just going to assume, and it is a big assumption, but I'm going to assume the demographic in this in this video. Um, I'm going to assume that you are between the ages of 16 and 25. This seems to be the most popular demographic that is listening to this type of podcast. What is it that you can do about it? Um, There's a few things. Unfortunately, the main thing has been, at least for me, was the 25 rule, which I spoke about in my first episode, which is unfortunately waiting till you are a little bit older and your hormones start calming down. And this goes for both men and women, by the way. And things do actually improve. It's hard to believe now, um, but it's true. It does actually work. But then there's the other demographic listening to this video that are of the older um, generation. And by older, I mean 25 and above that are still plagued and still affected by acne and want to know answers and want to know what they can do about it. Um, I'm not a dermatologist, so I'm not going to pretend that I know uh, everything about this. I'm purely speaking from an anecdotal point of view, from my own personal experience, but also just from some of the papers that I've read. There's a lot of popular treatments that we can we can use. Um, the benzoyl peroxide is one of the easiest accessible ones that we we've spoken about before. This is a a cream that dries out the skin horrendously. And I use this quite religiously for nearly a year uh, in my youth. Um, I destroyed pretty much every bed sheet and every towel and every nice t-shirt that I 
owned uh, in that year because of this um, this cream. Um, it basically bleaches everything and anything with color, it just ruins. So just have that in mind if you're if you're trying to um, th- or thinking about using it. And also just know that you can get it in two different strengths. At least in the UK, you can. It's two point five or five percent, and I think there's a two percent as well. And the lower strengths actually have about as much evidence base for the as, as the stronger ones. So buying the strong one doesn't necessarily mean it works faster or better. So actually, just even the low strength is is just as good, and it dries out the skin a lot. If you combine it with moisturizer, it does help, and it just limits the amount of oil production, which clogs up the pores and causes acne. So what else do I want to say about this this updated episode? I was thinking a lot about the issues with isotretinoin, with Roaccutane. Um, My viewpoints on this medication haven't changed. And my stance on it is it's a terrible, terrible drug. I don't like it. I've used it. And I'm talking from my experience as someone who's been on it, albeit a long time ago, but the drug hasn't changed. Um, And I just want to let people know my story behind the use of Roaccutane and how uh, terrible it was for me. I didn't keep using it long enough to be able to say categorically that it was good for or not for 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 acne um in the short time i did use it and by short i mean six weeks versus the three or so months that you're meant to use it for um but i noticed that in the six weeks yes things did did clear up but it, it came as a price and that price was the cost of my mental well-being it came at the price of um to some extent my sanity I was at medical school during the time that I was using it. I was a fourth year medical student. And I'll repeat the story from from before, but essentially it was the only time I've ever failed an exam at medical school um, was when I was on it and I was doing a practical exam. And I was I was good at practical exams. I really enjoyed them. I had fun doing them. And compared to a written exam, I, I would score infinitely higher. Um, this was the only time I failed a practical and I was taking Roaccutane at the time. And all I remember doing was uh, wanting to crawl up into a little ball and go to sleep. With the the way the practical exam is set out, you have these different stations. So imagine different hospital bays and each station has got its own um, theme to it. There might be a, a information giving station there might be an examination station there might be a discuss um, this treatment with a patient station and you get examined on these different different things and in between each each station there's um every now and then there's a five minute rest period where you can sit down and you wait five minutes and then the buzzer goes and you go to your next station and i remember in these five minute rest stations i was just running to the fan that was in the corner of the room, uh, trying to circulate the air and just standing in front of it for the whole five minutes and running then to the next exam station. And the reason was because my I felt like I was burning up. I, I don't know what my temperature was, but I think it was 39 and above. At least that's what it felt like. Uh, I was boiling and I couldn't think of anything else other than just trying to become cool. And it wasn't from the stress of the exam or anything like that. It was just physical heat. I was generating a lot of heat. Um, and it was it was actually very unpleasant to feel that way. So when I would get into the station, my, my brain was just very foggy. I couldn't remember anything that I had read. I couldn't actually articulate a basic sentence. And I know every night, now and then I do stutter on occasion with uh, my words. I do fumble around sometimes, but this was on a different level. This was on uh, a level where people were asking me if I was okay. And anyway, I failed the exam, not by very much, 
which I was quite surprised about, but I did did fail it and I had to redo it. And I decided that uh, reacting was a was a problem. So I stopped taking it after the six weeks. And when the drug started to clear, which took a little while, but as it started to clear, it was, as I've described before, just like a, a fog had been lifted and I could literally just see everything in clarity again. I could remember things, I could um, speak more eloquently. I didn't have this feeling of wanting to sit into a, in the corner of a room, curled into a ball, just wanting to sleep. Um, the one thing I will say also did is it made me very, very depressed at the time. Um, and it's only looking back at that now that I can really appreciate just how how uncomfortable it made me. I'd sit there and just be really, really sad and not actually have a particularly good reason as to why I was sad. But I, I just felt that way. And there was part of me that knew that this drug that had just been introduced into my life was the cause. And I don't have evidence for it. But all I can say is I didn't feel like that before. I f didn't feel like that after. But during the time, it, it felt um, I felt very unhappy. And there's been a lot of debates about this. I'm not the only one who felt this way. There's been a lot of suicidal ideation. There's been a lot of cases of, of patients taking their own lives whilst being on isotretinoin. And we don't really know why. There's been a lot of discussion that this, this drug actually causes severe depression. But the flip side of that is, were these patients depressed beforehand because they had severe acne and they were taking a medicine for it, it wasn't working as well as they'd hoped, or, or all these different things. There's confounding factors, shall we say. But from my, like I say, anecdotal experience, I would say this drug has um, not insignificant side effects uh, with regards to depression and, and mental health. The, um, the next is, did it work? Yeah, yeah, to some extent it did actually. It dried my lips out horrendously and and it I suffered with dry lips for, I would say six years, maybe seven after taking it, even though I had no other symptoms uh, or no other side effects. I remember um, needing lip balm or something on my on my lips for for at least six seven years afterwards. It just it was something that wouldn't go away no matter what I did, um, and it's only sort of in the last few years I've noticed that things are things are back to normal really. So um, people that say that it doesn't affect your lips or your dryness, I I, I think they're lying if I'm honest because that's something that I think everyone gets affected by and and that's actually part of why it works so well is because it dries your sebaceous glands um there's other things you have to keep taking liver function tests so you have to keep having regular blood tests because it does impact your liver and mine actually did become irregular whilst i was on it nothing that wasn't reversible but it was something that can potentially be long-term harm which is why you have to keep taking blood tests by the by the doctor um, or, or your local nurse each every, I think it was two weeks. Um, and that's something quite telling. If you're having to take regular blood tests for a medication for acne, you have to be very sure that this is something that you want to be taking. So it, it's really hard for me to recommend this drug that caused so many problems for me and also just the fact that you need blood tests whilst taking on it is completely contraindicated in pregnancy. It's a teratogenic drug. This means it's a drug that causes birth defects to an unborn baby and can harm the baby also whilst you're breastfeeding as the, the, the drug does pass through the milk ducts. When you have to take it, when you have to take a pregnancy test before, during and after taking this drug uh, because of the damage it can it can do, it, it does beg the question about the is this worth is this worth it for acne? Um, bear in mind this is a drug that was actually created and designed to treat certain types of skin cancer. Uh, it wasn't actually designed as a as an anti acne drug. It just happened that one of the side effects, so to speak, was that people noticed their acne was clearing up 
immensely. And so it was taken. Do I recommend it? As you probably gathered, no. Can I understand why people take it? Yes, absolutely I can. Um, I was one of those people. Um, which brings the next question. Is there a case for it? Is there a time where people should use it? I don't know the answer to that. Um, that's a very difficult one to, to really answer because everyone is different. And I think what I would say is it should be reserved for the most, and to some extent it is reserved for the most severe cases of cystic acne, acne that's causing scarring, um, keloid scar, scarring acne as well. So I can understand that uh, it is, even if it is reserved for those those cases, each case has to be taken by a case by case basis. It needs a discussion with your dermatologist, a specialist doctor. It needs a very very uh, long discussion uh, where all the risks are discussed. And I think the monitoring that you should be on if you decide to take this drug it should be really up there not just with the blood test but actually someone asking you if, if you are okay and actually maybe doing a, a wellness check every week with with you because seeing the impact that this can have on your mental well-being and just just on your just overall health is is quite dramatic that said i have to give a balanced argument and i know people and I have met people who have been on it who actually had no real issues. So I have to give the flip side of that coin. However, I believe that they are few and far between. And the question is, you don't know what type of person you are going to be, whether you're going to be the one that gets affected very, very badly or the one that gets affected very, very minimally. You may just get the dry lips and nothing else and think, fine, I can put up with a little bit of Vaseline and lip balm on my lips every every time I go out a few times a day. Um, that's worth the the clean the clean skin. Or you can be someone affected, and I will say I was affected mildly. I don't say I was affected that severely because um, I thankfully didn't have permanent liver damage. I didn't have... Um, suicidal ideation to the point where I carried anything out as some studies have or some some cases have shown. So on that basis, uh, I do have to talk about the pros and cons of, of something as, as we should do in, in every aspect in medicine. Just please be careful. And if there is an alternative, I think that should be explored first. The alternatives, I won't bore you with what I've said in the in the past in great detail, but there are alternatives. See your GP, seek antibiotic, topical antibiotic treatment can work well. Actual oral antibiotics can work well. Benzoyl peroxide, like I said, it damages everything you ever owned in terms of any, any fabric with color, but it can help and has been shown to help. There's a brilliant website, I think it's acne.com or acne.org. Uh, this guy has come up with the regime uh, for which is what he calls it. And I remember this when I was at university, he would put um, benzoyl peroxide on his skin, mix it with a lot of moisturizer. And thankfully it would, um, over time, it would actually clear up his skin. And he he created this kind of regime of the, of, of the right amount to mix it with. And, and it was actually quite successful. And there's a lot of testimonials on his website. So I've got to give him credit for that. It's quite impressive. And I haven't tried it myself, but it's something that might be worth a go. Short on this, I want to talk a bit about other things that have helped me. And there was something quite dramatic. I did touch on this in my first episode. And that was, there was an element to my diet that I couldn't quite work out that I believed was linked to my acne exacerbation. And that was, every time I moved to a different flat or a different um, different house while studying or just during my first few years at, at, um, on the job when we moved around a lot, I noticed that my skin cleared up quite dramatically and I couldn't quite work out why. It was so bizarre. And 
I ended up keeping a diary um, because I I thought it's got to be something to do with food because my um, my fridge was always empty when I moved because I couldn't be bothered to go and do any shopping. Um, It was always uh, computer, hi-fi, TV, and uh, yeah, that was they were the priorities at the time, especially when you're when you're studying. Um, So I didn't really care much about food at the time, and so I would. have an empty fridge and I realized there was something that I was having during my time when I'd settled down and eating that was causing this flare up. And it was through a lot of trial and error that I realized that the thing that I bought the le- the, the last was, and the latest was, was, was milk. And I realized that dairy products, especially milk, was the biggest exacerbator of my acne and I then did some research as most medical students would do at the time um, or most junior doctors would do and I realized that uh, through a lot of research that this was not an unknown thing it was the first time I'd come across it but it turns out that yes it has been acknowledged that there is a link between um, milk and dairy and and acne and the reason behind this is very simple and it makes so much sense and by default it's pregnant cows that are uh, milked because non-pregnant cows don't lactate so pregnant cows or or cows have just given birth they continue to be milked and so they continue to produce um continue to produce uh, the milk and they this milk actually contains growth hormones as it would do, like any milk does, because you want the, the the calf, you want the baby to grow. Now, these growth hormones in cow's milk are very, very similar to the type of growth hormones that you get during puberty and whilst we're growing up. So it makes complete sense that with these growth hormones, you're going to get an exacerbation of your acne because it causes inflammation, um, causes an increase in sebum production and all these other things. So when I cut milk out as a trial, my acne just cleared up completely. And actually I went quite extreme. I, I cut out all dairy for a brief period of time. Not the healthiest thing to do um, without taking supplements and doing it correctly. And but for for a month or so, I I cut out as much dairy and as much milk as as I could, even to the point where I was looking at every packet of food that I was buying. And if it said may contain milk or contains milk, I would not buy it. This was a very tricky thing to do and quite an extreme experiment. But I'm glad I did it at the time and I found it did work. Do I recommend it? Um, Perhaps not to this extreme. And I would do it with help. And by that, I mean, I would speak to a medical professional about how to do it safely. They can refer you to dietitians and all the rest. By all means, if you're going to cut something out like milk, there's got to be alternatives. You do need some of the nutrients, the calcium and all the rest that, that are in milk to live a normal, healthy life. So do, do, do some research on milk alternatives and what you have to do um, if you're going to cut something like that out of your diet. And then you can focus on the other things and um, as, as, as needed, things like cheese and what have you. But I did find that dairy and uh, milk in particular was the biggest change for me. Um, am I still doing this? No. And I I don't really care too much about what I'm what I'm eating at, at the moment. I've what I found is that as I got older, the extent that this I had to be stringent on on milk and all the rest actually became less and less. I found myself just being able to enjoy a bowl of cereal and actually having milk in my tea again and and and, and what have you. So I I slowly started to reintroduce dairy and milk into my diet um over the next sort of couple of years as it were from from when this happened and as it's as i've um got older it has become a lot less of an issue do i still get flare-ups yes and oddly enough it is usually 
I find milk or diet related uh, when they do happen. Um, I've tried to establish some form of link between alcohol and flare ups, as I noticed after a, a beer, I would sometimes get a get a flare up, and there's no actual evidence for this, but there is a thought that actually alcohol um, exacerbates inflammation and the inflammation you can see when you've got, uh, if you're susceptible to, to acne, if you're, if you're susceptible to spots, these spots then become inflamed. So it's another thing that might be worth cutting down or out altogether, alcohol, um, and see how that goes, goes for you. Sugar as well. Sugar causes inflammation. This we know. And I actually think that having a, a, a low sugar diet not only is good for you, but actually may help um, reduce your the inflammation in our skin and may help decrease the exacerbation of, of, of acne too. So there's a few things that can be tried. The other thing I want to dispel is during this whole acne journey when I was younger, there was so much in terms of products on the market. There was so much in terms of things you could read about and um, different advices online. And you can argue that this is similar to that for sure. But I want to say all these adverts that you see uh, with, you know, Clearasil and all these other brands that uh, that have promised us these beautiful model-like skins and uh, and after a few washes and and all the rest, do they work? Maybe a little bit. Personally, I didn't think they did much. Um, you do have to use them for a certain amount of time, eight weeks to be precise, to notice any form of improvement. And the reason for that is because your skin actually has an eight-week cycle. So you create dead skin and then you produce new skin. This whole cycle creates eight, uh, is about eight weeks long. So you're not going to see uh, a difference. The products that you use affect your next skin cycle growth. It's affecting the skin that hasn't yet grown yet. So it's not going to affect so much what, what you've already got and what's already in the in mid-cycle, mid shall we say. So using these products eight weeks down the line, you'll, you'll see whether they've made a difference or not. A lot of people can't wait eight weeks, myself included. I found waiting eight weeks for an improvement when usually you've just gone to the supermarket to, or you've seen it and you want to buy it uh, immediately and hope for a change that evening. It's not going to happen. It's unfortunate, but I have to say it. It's just it's uh, when you want to go to parties and go out and you want to look nice and you have these very um, very obvious blotches on your face, it can make you feel very, very sad. Um, the one thing I will say, and this is something looking back at the time and something that I'm, uh, I want to share some wisdom about, is that the person who notices them is you. Very, very few, if anyone does. And that might be you might be thinking that's completely rubbish and that it's impossible for no one to notice and and that I'm I'm just trying to, you know, uh make you feel better um using nothing but words, empty words at that. But I, I promise it's not it it, it it promise what I'm saying is actually true in that sense. It's a bit of a myth that's sold to us by dare I say it, um, social media and uh, magazines, and not to mention the the companies producing these um, these face washes and uh, and all the rest. And sometimes just gentle patting on the face with water, rather than these very very harsh chemicals containing lots of acids and um, all these other things in them that can be very abrasive to your skin. Sometimes just just simple water on very inflamed skin is is the best thing. You don't need to use harsh soaps on it. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and this goes beyond the acne side of things, is we've spoken a bit about diet and how certain things can cause acne. And again, from my own anecdotal experience, but also just from other case studies as well. There's going to be a lot of diets that claim to be detoxing or cleansing. 
this is the biggest pile of rubbish ever. I mean, there is no food or no diet that can detox you. I've always wondered, and I've always wanted to ask the people that that create these foods that say this 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 would detox you. People like who, who come up with the lemon juice diet or something like that. I just want to ask them: What toxins are you detoxing from your body? I guarantee you, no one will be able to answer that question because the answer is none. There are no toxins that you cannot get rid of. Your lungs, your liver, your kidneys do a perfectly, perfectly adequate job as they have done for billions of years, getting rid of toxins in your urea, in your, in your urine and breathing out and, and so on. You do not need detoxing foods. This, this is not something that is a thing. It's simply pure marketing BS. And it's unfortunate because when you are desperate for a treatment, desperate for a cure, you will try anything. And when you're met with the with the words detoxing or cleansing, you will try it. And I, I can speak from experience in that that sense. But I just want to say that this is rubbish and um, you don't need any special foods to detox your body. They do not do any detoxing whatsoever. Um, and that's another episode uh, in its own in its own right. So I'll skip over that for the time being. There's a few things you can also do as well. Um, whilst acne is not a disease of hygiene, um, I hope everyone listening to that listening to this episode knows that um, it's not a disease whereby, oh, you're not showering enough or you're not um, cleaning your face enough. This is really not the case. It's it's uh, hormonal imbalance, increased sebum production. It's, it's all these things. There are still things that can be done. It's often very good practice just to change pillowcases quite often. Um, and this is something I've started to do or tried to do a little bit more often than I, I used to in the past because you do notice that actually over time there is a buildup of bacteria, there is a buildup of dirt on, on your pillowcases and they can exacerbate acne prone skin. So it's something that's worth doing. Even um, if you use, what I've noticed is, as you can probably tell, I've got wax in my hair. Um, this actually, sometimes if I'm using it every day, I do notice I get some spots on my forehead because of where the, the gel is is on touching my skin. Um, and if I have if gone through a long shift or a long day and I haven't had a shower or, you know, uh, wash my hair uh, for a few hours, for about 10 or so hours, then I do notice that I do get a, a little small breakout. So all these little things that can exacerbate things, it's just worth noting. And you know you. So it's just something to keep in mind. But as I said, lots of different things to try out. If you are considering isotretinoin as a last alternative, I can't emphasize this enough. Please have a very long chat with your dermatologist as it's imperative. I just want people to know that there are some other alternatives that can be tried first. And I just want people to be aware of the risks involved in going down this really quite dramatic and quite serious treatment option. Because don't forget, this was a drug created for skin cancer. It was created as a as a, as a drug to treat certain types of melanoma. So when you're using a form of chemotherapy for acne, you've got to be sure. It's, it's, uh, it's something that you've really got to chat about with great length with your dermatologist. I can't emphasize that enough um, because, and do bring up the concerns about it. They will be able to either put you at ease or they'll be able to talk to you about other alternatives or potentially what to look out for or even just um, look out for you more frequently than they would normally recommend. So it's worth just bringing it up and I just want people to be aware of 
the different things that are involved with taking a, a medication like this. I'm not saying it doesn't help everyone or it, it it causes these problems to everyone who takes it. But I just want people to be aware of, of the fact that it can do these things. I've experienced some of them and it's something that I think is important that people know. So whilst it's easy for me to say, I've said it before, we're all guilty of being self-conscious and of course I do understand but please remember that it really does not define you. It doesn't stop you making friends. It doesn't make your friends not like you. So with that, I will leave you. Please do subscribe to the channel. Leave a like, follow uh, for future episodes. And if you get a chance, please do leave a review. It really does help the show. And if there's any topics that you'd like me to discuss in the future episodes, please leave a comment either on my website or um, you know, by emailing me at a doctor's view at gmail.com. And as always, please take care of yourself and I'll join you again next time. I'm Dr. Bolivios. Goodbye.